Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Dev webinar. I'm Igor Marshall, our Chief Revenue Officer at DoHop, and I will have the pleasure to moderate today's discussion. Um, but first, uh, as we speak today, I just wanted to remind everyone that we have a, a sad anniversary. Uh, it's unfortunately been around about one year now uh, that uh, since all airlines uh, around the world have been crippled uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, if I remember well, it was the 11th of March 2020 that uh, World Health Organization had officially announced that it was a pandemic. So. The topic today really is about airlines and how technology and uh, agile partnerships uh, can speed up the recovery for those airlines uh, as they slowly but surely prepare and move towards a post-COVID world and a much anticipated rebound for the air travel industry. Uh, but as is often the case in a, after any of these major uh, industry crisis, the airline industry has got a, a real opportunity also to rethink its ways of doing business and um, managing its network successfully in a new way. So um, today you have uh, how many airlines that EasyJet is connected with? 17. 17, okay. So out of the 17, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, so you've connected with long haul full service carriers whilst EasyJet is still very much a short haul uh, and considered as a low cost carrier. So what was your experience? So you were talking about uh, a plug and play out of the box technology, um, but there's a commercial element and, and, and a technical element to, to this. Um, what I'm interested to hear is how did you, did you guys approach and speak with all those long haul carriers um, from a commercial standpoint? What was the conversation like? Were they happy to kind of marry up with you guys. Uh, and the question also goes out to Christian, our CTO uh, at DoHop, uh, whose team was in charge of and connecting the wires, so to speak, with those partner airlines. So maybe on the commercial side for you, Antonio. First. Yeah, yes, I can start. Yeah. Um, just to put this in context, um, it's a very good question. And uh, at the beginning of this journey, I could say that the common belief around worldwide by EasyJet was that this was a product and platform only to connect low cost to low cost career, given maybe most of the time the similarity of the simplicity of a PSS or the fair bundle structure, pricing rules and so on. And maybe most of the time integrating that full service career, uh, it's a bit more complex or take a bit lo more longer than a, a low cost career. So there are no doubts about this. But what I personally have seen is an increasing interest from full service career to join this platform year by year. And specifically now in this moment, uh, during this tough time of you know, pandemic where the demand is very weak, um, currently are increasing the restriction, all the islands are struggling to survive and are reducing their schedule. There is a lot of interest for every airline to just improve the connectivity and connect and offer their customer an answered experience and an and, and, and network without changing their business model, without uh, deploy short haul play, narrow body or long haul wide body. So I can proudly say that I receive on a weekly basis a lot of message of interest between a lot of airlines and most of them are full service career. So from a pure commercial side, well, let's say that um, a lot of the, the most part of the discussion is all around IT and tech. So we cannot uh, forget about this. Uh, but a huge part of the discussion is also around products and ancillary because the full service career are very interested to offer to their customer a seamless uniform experience uh, to give to their customer the best um, experience during their journey and to end. And given the peculiarity of the uh, business model of the low cost versus the full service career, product uh, play a big role. Um, I don't know if Christian for sure can add something else. Definitely, yeah, Christian, the question goes out to you. So, of course, EasyJet knows what they have in store in terms of ancillaries and the way they want to be merchandised. 
but since they are building itineraries that uh, involve a third party airline, how did these conversations go then with that airline that uh, was opening up its content, its inventory uh, to, be, to be mixed uh, with, uh, with EasyJets? Yeah, maybe sort of continuing where uh, Antonio left about uh, full service carriers and, and sort of the, the request for uh, maybe more uh, or, or deeper integration into ancillaries and, and, uh, and uh, sort of uh, service uh, and service level. So, uh, and the difference between working between a, a full service carrier and a low cost carrier. Uh, we, uh, on, on, on our side, we work closely with the carriers, adding them into World Club EasyJet. And uh, what I've learned in the last three years or so is that the full service carriers, they tend to ask a lot of, uh, sort of more questions about uh, like the service level uh, and about uh, disruptions uh, and et cetera, because they're experienced in serving the passengers with interline connections. And I, I think we, we, we took a lot of learnings out of that as well, which is important. Uh, so it's, a, it's a definitely a, a, a benefit, uh, including a full service carrier in a project like this. Um, they, uh, well, maybe for the same reason, they tend to take sort of planning and, and QA uh, more seriously, which is, uh, can also be a benefit, and, but it also takes more time to, to uh, add a full service carrier into a virtual interline product because it's more sort of, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, not, maybe it's, 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 it's different to what they are, are used to. So the, what the propositions can be, uh, can be different and that's actually simpler. So it's actually, that's why I think they have more questions on this. Um, also about the, maybe the cons of, of working with full service carriers versus a low cost carrier is that they tend to maybe not to have the technology ready, but which is uh, needed, uh, uh, an API, an DC API or any other API that allows you to shop and book their, their uh, inventory. And uh, so often they introduce third party um, technology provider and um, which can be fine which actually can be uh, we that we have already have an integration with the third party so it's actually a plug and play to add the full service carrier into a product like world wide easy yet but if it's a new one then there we have three parties and then things get uh, well it might take more time for that reason um then we we also see some sort of legacy pulled in uh, uh, working with full service carriers because they're used to different office IDs per point of sale, which is uh, you don't see with uh, LCCs normally. So it's uh, like the rollout strategy might be different. They might just want to include a set of um, point of sales to begin with and sort of slowly sort of uh, uh, adopt to, to, to this uh, model. And so that's a little bit different. And um, yeah, and then they maybe have um, sort of more stakeholders and, and maybe the existing infrastructure on, on, on partnership and etc. So they they bring in sort of more uh, or bigger team to, to work with and, and um, so yeah the conversation is it can be different. So definitely. Yeah. So the, the key word here is uh, agility and, and and making sure that uh, we adapt to the tech stack and to the particular uh, configuration and, mm. and context of each airline that. Uh, would want to uh, distribute its content through, uh, through a third party partner. Yeah. So interesting. So what we've seen um, at the very beginning of this uh, webinar uh, with, uh, with, with John kind of uh, painting us uh, the, the story or the history of, uh, of, uh, of Interline uh, in, in the airline world. Um, I'd like to turn now to, to Nick, Nick from Welling. Uh, hello, Nick. Uh, what I wanted to hear as your airline insider as well, um, is what you would see or consider as being the limitations of traditional interline in the context really of this lingering pandemic we have to face uh, from an insider airline point of view. Um, in, in what ways do you see that maybe virtual interline would meet today's needs for more agility in, in, in helping with this post-COVID recovery? Well, thank you, Igor. First of all, thank you for inviting me along to this session. It's a pleasure to participate. Um, I think the interesting thing here, and Antonio has touched on this already, is that, that Interline isn't universal. 
Now, Welling's in a unique position because Welling started its life as a low-cost ticketless carrier hosting Navitaire. But over time, what we, well, essentially what happened was when we were bought by IAG, we needed to, to develop our business model and adapt our processes in order to work with legacy carriers. And what that taught us is that, that having to make these developments puts a bit of pressure on our business as such. So there's a lot of resource implications in terms of being able to develop your capabilities to, to manage Interline. There's also a cost implication there as well. But Interline isn't necessarily a tool that is easy for a low cost carrier to work with. Now, what we found as well is that, that as a Navitaire hosted carrier, we want to develop our own capabilities with our own product. Um, we need to be able to, to uh, focus on our own proposition, for example. We have this need to sell ancillaries, and Interline hasn't always enabled us to do that. So, so what we essentially want is something that we can plug and play. As we develop our API content, it's important for us to be able to work with the new generation of carriers. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, very insightful. Um, what I'd like to maybe also uh, suggest is that we, uh, we, we, we hear or, or the pulse of a network and, and, and the industry coming from a, a veteran, if I may uh, call you a veteran, um, Mark from Airline Pros. Um, your company represents and, and provides solutions to quite a few tier two and tier three carriers around the world. Um, so we have a mix of both LCCs and, and legacy uh, uh, model airlines uh, around the world that you speak to on a daily basis, what are they actually telling you about what's driving their interest about virtual interline? Because you know, it's been around for a number of years now, but there seems to be more, more interest into this alternative way of uh, distributing and, and, and managing your network than, than in pre previous years. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, Igor, thank you very much for, for inviting me to, to join such a distinguished panel here. Um, very interesting. From our position as airline pros, airline pros international, where we work with we're well over 50 carriers now on a global basis, uh, we were looking into and, and getting more and more involved with this whole notion of virtual interlining or interlining 2.0 prior to the pandemic or COVID. Uh, coming onto the scene, but uh, no question that um, this has been really a, a catalytic event that from the feedback that we're getting from the carriers, their spiked interest in this, um, it, it's really now we're, we're kind of in a seismic shift of, of attention to distribution concerns. And uh, so out of the 50 plus global clients that we've got, um, they basically fall into one of two different categories, either the the legacy model carriers, you know, the ones that are used to interlining the, if you will, the old fashioned way, the, the, the models that we've been following for what, 50, 60 plus years. Um, but many of them are realizing that it, it's quite inefficient and that they're looking for smarter solutions, smarter ways of doing business. And then we have on the other side, we have the, the LCC or the newer carriers, the ones that are a bit more nimble, they're, they're more progressive in their thinking, limited infrastructure. I mean, they just don't have the ballooned out um, infrastructure for, for older processes. You know, they, they see the advantage of the interlining. Um, they obviously want the revenue or the business that comes from it, but they're well enough disciplined that they won't accept it on the terms of doing these old legacy or archaic processes that drive so much complexity and in infrastructure and, and cost. I mean, it just, as it adds to your overall cost of sale, it's just prohibitive for them. So their view is that how do we accomplish both, not one or the other, but how with what's going on now, particularly in the current environment. And that's basically both groups having um, similar objectives. It's about more incremental passengers, fully incremental passengers, and at lower distribution costs. Now, okay. how to get there, and, and what's most important for them varies a bit by the airline type. Obviously, the LCCs are looking for more of the interline feed. They know it's essential to them. Some of them, they're absolutely dependent on that in order to, to survive or in order to grow, but they have to find a way to do it without buying into all the, the legacy structure. 
And then on the, the legacy carriers, the following the legacy model, um, particularly the, the, the larger global networks, global airlines, what they're looking for is they now more than ever got to get more feed from behind and beyond their long haul segments. You know, in, in the post pandemic environment that's going to be with us for a good while now, carriers, network carriers, they've got contracting networks. They're not flying everywhere they used to. And so as a result, they're now more dependent upon feed traffic. They're not getting it all from their own online. And they want to, they want to engage with, they want to get it from the LCCs and the regionals, but they know they have to do it in a more efficient way than what they've done up to this point without that cost. So really in this cost cutting time, they can't afford to keep following the same old model. Now, yes, there are some established and legacy carriers that just haven't wisened up to this as yet. They're still clinging to the old ways of doing business. But I think what we're seeing now, definitely uh, an increase in, in the legacy carriers that realize that they've got to find a way to do business on uh, reasonable cost and, and complexity terms with the, uh, with the regional carriers, with the LCCs. So then the question becomes, and what we're working with them on is how do we use these emerging technologies for not just incremental, but really step change results. You know, you take the new mindset, you take the shift that's happened after an event like this, you take tools that are available now that weren't available before, and that leads to how do we make these changes? How do we quickly, efficiently implement them? You know, one of the questions when we talk about the, the legacy and the LCC carriers that need to, to work together. It's how do we quickly and efficiently create interlining between a ticketless and a ticketing carrier? I mean, just the notion, for example, and, and you know, I've got a lot of admiration for, you take a look at what EasyJet has done. So now you can interline or virtually interline between EasyJet and Singapore Airlines or EasyJet and, and Emirates. You know, these are, these are great examples. How much more does this open up in terms of your total distribution, in terms of your marketing capability. But then the other questions or the concerns that come up is how do we, how do, we do this virtually seamlessly while at the same time looking after the customer, making sure that the customer's interests from a transparency point and also from a service point is also covered and taken care of. You know, how do we make this interlining easy to administer? How do we cut the, the archaic complexity how do we dump all the heavy contracts and you know weeks and months of SPA negotiations and fair filings and the complexity of interline billings and currency conversions and all that other baggage that went along with the old model? How do we also get the cost efficiencies? I mean, you know, you really a lot of carriers are become very very interested when you talk about a platform and interlining that does not require a, a GDS or GDS fees or no IET testing or te IET testing costs, particularly when you're looking at uh, uh, testing across two different PSS systems. Um, no interline service charges. Wow, there, there's a big savings there. No clearinghouse costs, no waiting for your uh, payment. It's payment at time of transaction, rather at time of sale, rather than uh, you know, 30, 40 days after flown. So it's really about the carriers want to see how do we streamline this down to something simple everyday practice without the heavy infrastructure. It, it, it then creates an empowerment. It's, it's an ability for them to be able to do more commercially driven rather than process driven. That allows these airlines to be able to, to control and to, and to fully market their own product. Um, they can be a lot more effective in, in, in dynamic in real time doing the pricing for their product. They're not beholden to fares that were an SPA rates that were filed and could have been obsolete months ago. And really importantly, it allows them and what they're interested in is the ability to use the digital marketing, the fair marketing, if you will, that, that they're already embracing to be able to turn on new ONDs, to, to expand their networks, um, to be considered in itineraries that they wouldn't have been considered in before. So it, it really makes it truly incremental. And then they also like the idea of being able to be offered in front of more end consumers, not just what's done on an OTA or through a travel agency, but to the growing number of end consumers who are shopping for these connections online. So, you know, it all comes back to really two fundamentals, more customers and lower distribution costs. 
And this, this, this post-pandemic environment, this is when things are permanently changing in, in not evolutionary, but step change ways. And there are carriers out there, we're, we're happy to be working with a lot of them, that they want to be proactive. They want to get the jump start on it. And uh, that's what they're telling us. Thank you, Mark. Thank yeah. you. Especially coming from someone with 30 plus years of experience in the airline uh, industry. Uh, that, yeah. that, that definitely shows that you, you, you seem passionate about the topic even more than myself. So uh, it's yeah. very pleasing to hear. So it's you touched on... Going. <laughs> You touched on an interesting topic. You were talking about baggages. So what I, we do hear airlines also say is that, hey, yeah, but, you know, virtual interline is not quite like the traditional interline. It's not quite the same thing. We're not comparing apples to apples. There is in the traditional interline some seamlessness and frictionless servicing. Um, customers' uh, experience is important and will remain even post-COVID important. Um, whilst virtual interline, uh, by and large, remains a self-connect product. Um, so uh, people would not remain uh, outside throughout the connection. So I'd like to go back to, to, to Nick, again, uh, an airline insider, uh, Nick from Welling, to uh, tell us what, what do you think about self-connect in, in itself? Is it really such a, uh, a hindrance or a deterioration in the, the user experience, or does uh, does it have a minor impact and, and, and would not deter people from actually using a virtual interline flight? Well, we know that people are self-connecting today. So as Antonio explained in terms of the setup of Worldwide by EasyJet, that was done because EasyJet and Gatwick recognized that, were people, that people were, were doing this themselves. And there was an opportunity there to, to improve the process, if you like. And I have a very personal experience here that really drives or drove my thinking. I'm a commuter, or at least I was before COVID, between Barcelona and Newbury in the UK. And in order to get home every week, I needed to book a ticket on an airline on Welling, be sure I was into Heathrow. Then I had to book a separate ticket on the bus to get to Reading Station, and then a separate ticket to get from Reading to Newbury. And Basically, what this has taught me is there are improvements that need to be made there. There is a demand for such connection journeys. People are going to take them, but there really is a big opportunity to improve how we put a product in front of the customer. And, and as Mark touched on, there's an increasing requirement for airlines to get involved in that, certainly from a retail point of view. We want to be able to offer more of those elements in the customer journey. And we're not doing that to the extent that we'd like today. So, Interline for us has been limited. Our ability to go out and put these connections together, especially as a, a, a ticketless carrier, is difficult. Even in the interline world, for things like intermodality, the opportunities are just kind of limited, especially for Welling, where we don't really have that capability and it's not in our business model as such. And what we're discovering as we have conversations with different players across the ecosystem is that the traditional legacy ticketed setup isn't necessarily designed to help us deliver there. What you're seeing, of course, not just with airlines, but also train companies, bus companies, etc., is that there are new players in the market. There are different players who want to be part of that value chain, the travel proposition. So what we as an airline want to be able to do is to put that product in front of the customer. We know people want to get from A to C, we want to be able to offer more parts of that journey. And what we've found is this hybrid carrier, as I say, is in the traditional interline world, we just can't offer this. Even with NDC, NDC isn't relevant at the moment to some of those lower cost carriers in the market. It's certainly not relevant to bus and train companies. So what we're looking for is opportunities to start developing, A, the, first, the capability to sell, offer these customer offer these products to customers from a distribution point of view but then how can we work to improve the processes or the operational elements of self-connect how do we work to deliver seamless connectivity and the way i look at this is that the drawbacks that exist here are opportunities we have to remember that the Seamlessness doesn't always exist in the traditional world either. We've all lost bags when we've traveled, for example. We've all experienced misconnections and not been handled as well as perhaps we'd like to be. 
But my position here is that, that there are technological developments coming in the market. We're seeing airports get more involved in terms of how they can support things like virtual inline proposition. How can we get that bag from the airport to the train station to your home? There's providers outside the ecosystem who are looking at things like this. And what we want to get to is a position where, where we understand what the customer wants, what customer proposition do we have to develop, do we have to offer in order to make our product as, as effective as it can be? First and foremost, we want to get the distribution right. We want to sell these products and we're just not doing that at the moment. That's the first thing. Once we've got that in play, we want to be able such things as boarding passes right the way through your journey, your bags being through checked to your own destination. So the two things we'll always come back to here. How can we optimize our distribution? How can we offer more product to the customer to get them from their origin to their destination? How do we expand our capability there? How do we offer more than we do today with air partners, rail partners, bus partners, et cetera? And how do we do this in a way that delivers a seamless customer proposition? Thank you, Nick. Yes, you, you're right in pointing out that uh, we have to live with uh, 40 plus years of IATA regulations surrounding uh, baggage handling. And you know, this is, these are processes that are now well established across the airline industry, uh, coming in with an innovative value proposition will take some time and it won't be a get it perfect from in one shot, it will be iterative. So creating the connection, getting the traffic because there's clearly demand as we see, uh, an appetite from travelers who are happy to self-connect. And then if we can then through technology create that seamlessness and, and we're not far away from this. We already have a few use cases, as you mentioned at, at airport level and even uh, with Ayachi with, with, with at airline levels. So, so there, there are solutions that need to be uh, enabled and, and will involve multiple stakeholders and, and, and the entire industry, I guess, you know, but yeah. once we, we do get uh, full traction. So it all sounds great. And uh, if I were an airline listening to this webinar, I would say, wow, you know, where do I sign? But, you know, I can have some doubts because this is the sales talk and maybe it is not as seamless or easy and plug and play as that. So I would like to ask one last question here to the one person who was clearly not into selling and he will have that language of truth, which is again, our CTO, Christian. Um, so if I were an airline, can you tell us what would be the milestones in a nutshell huh, uh, of what it would take to create virtual interline for me for a platform uh, co-hosted uh, on the back of my uh, usual uh, airline.com website. Thank you, Igor. Yes, I'll, I can walk through the sort of milestones and what we require from the airline side. And, and um, uh, feel free, Antonio, as well, to sort of add to something that I, I, I'm uh, missing for some reason. So normally it takes about three to four months uh, after a carrier um, signs with us uh, that wants to have a virtual interline platform with his own branding. Uh, yeah, it takes three to four months to, to configure uh, and to, uh, develop on our site. Sometimes it's even less and sometimes it's more depending on the level of customization that the partner is um, sort of, um, including in the, in the product or wants to be included in the product. What we need from a, an airline to able to create or, or set up the, the platform for an airline, we, first of all, uh, the airline needs to plan its uh, partnership strategy, like which carriers he wants to work with. And, and we, we can help with that, uh, definitely. We, we, we do have a um, uh, team on our side also to, to, to sort of map out what are the, sort of the potential best partners uh, from uh, full service carrier to LCCs and et cetera. And, and also we have a list of airlines that we are used to working with and we have already integrated their API. So we have some input there if, if, if you need help. If we need an API, uh, uh, an NTC API or other airline API, it can be proprietary API that allows you to shop and book. So sort of the and then yes, great if we, we can add ancillaries like uh, additional back and seat selection on top of that. That can be an API directly from an airline or from a, a third party, uh, either GTS or Fairlogic or some other aggregator that um, we are used to working with all sorts of type of APIs. 
Um, planting guidelines, we need as well from airlines or uh, airline to provide uh, a design draft, which will take care of implementing, but it's something we, we need, uh, at least the planting guideline. Uh, or we can actually, we, we can propose a, a design and then have your uh, feedback on as an airline if this is uh, what you expected. Uh, we need the airline to, to make one change to their website and that's uh, on their homepage in the search form or the search ports. Uh, you need to add additional ONDs. These are the ONDs that are new and are introduced by adding a partner to your network. And these are ONDs we supply with you. So you have regular data coming from us and you can decide if you use our API or a flat file or something to actually um, uh, add to your list of ONDs that you uh, are able to offer. Uh, then we need someone uh, from the airline side to work with on a regular basis. Uh, uh, a project manager that uh, handles our day-to-day -day communication with us and uh, introduces necessary um, team members on the island side, depending on uh, what we're working on. Often we need uh, someone from a island API team with some tech support or regarding questions or something that come up during an island API integration. Uh, often we have also speak to a digital team on the island side regarding, um, yeah, like branding and, and et cetera. Uh, yes, we work closely with um, uh, the, um, alliance team or, or partnership team and often maybe the project manager is exactly coming from the team from the airline and sometimes we, uh, we have uh, calls or with payment team or, or QA as well on the airline side so there are multiple sort of touch points with airlines but most most of the time it's a single person that we work with which is a project manager which is capable of sort of handling most of the uh, ongoing uh, work with us and then, yeah, obviously the LN needs to do internal comms about uh, how the project works and sort of update all, all the stakeholders internally. And then the last point for me, yeah, is the, it needs to also plan uh, and work on the distribution, not just on the airline side, but also on the, with betas or other distribution channels. And we can handle that as well. And, and, and uh, But that's something, yeah, the LN normally needs to pay attention to as well. Absolutely, and and this is one important part uh, uh, that uh, we are we are underline when speaking to uh, airline partners that uh, you know however good uh, new fares that we've constructed through this technology, they will only be sold. Uh, uh, if um, people know about them, and uh, we will have to go for, uh, beyond the natural reach of an airline's uh, website, mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking distribution here and and and, and marketing um, on the other uh, webinar panel um, uh, of today. Um, there is uh, Every Mundo, uh, a partner who's uh, helping airlines uh, distribute and 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 resurface. Uh, through uh, various uh, media channels, uh, those newly created fans. So it's, it's important to bear in mind that uh, uh, getting the, the, the pipeline and the groundwork foundation is, is only uh, one part of the work. And then it's about showcasing this extended network uh, for the airline to then make the most of it in terms of revenue and, and, and seats being booked. We've reached the end of this uh, webinar, so I would like to really uh, thank everybody again, uh, Christian, Nick, uh, Antonio, and Mark. Uh, it's been extremely insightful uh, and an enriching discussion we've had here today. And I very much look forward to, uh, to the next uh, webinar um, from Aviadev, uh, where uh, this kind of technology on, on virtual internet can be uh, discussed and debated uh, uh, with, uh, with other um, airline uh, industry experts. Again, thanks to everyone. Thanks to the audience for today. And I look forward to speaking to you soon again.